Yes, so I'm with the Office of Research and Development at EPA. Um, well, as we're one EPA, our mandate is really to underpin the science and engineering that supports not just regulations, but guidance and, and the general direction of the agency. And as you can tell from my Cincinnati accent, I <laughs> that one. And uh, I've spent a number of years working in Sydney, about 20 years. I worked with Sydney Water Corporation as their lead scientist for a number of years, and then invited into the University of New South Wales, where I was uh, head of the School of Civil Environmental Engineering at one stage, and, and led a group there in environmental engineering. So I'm going to bring some of that international perspective that I learned through the sort of academic front, and also had the privilege to work for a 10-year period in, in, in Sweden on their urban water project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about innovations in technologies, but how they fit into the whole package of doing this more systems analysis approach that is really underpinning what Ken has just been presenting on and, and what Valerie introduced. Um, and you know, there's a little diagram up there for those who like to see what, what we mean by sustainability. So you know, we can think of EPA's mission in some ways is to increase that block. So it's basically we've got three concentric circles and dealing with the three main pillars that we've been trying to talk about here from an economic perspective, from a societal perspective, and from an environmental perspective. But you know, why are we all here today? It's I would like to say something not really that controversial, but it's not really to do with <coughs> nutrients. Okay, let that sink in for a second. And why, in some ways, is that I want to explain, and I'm going to give you some background, but I think we've got, it all depends on how you frame a problem as to how you solve a problem. And we, we currently tend to frame the problem with a traditional view. We've had 150 years of building sewers, so we tend to think of that as a way of framing the solution. But we're not really about here about nutrients. It really is all about money. Those of you who live right on the coastal edge, you know you've got your property values to be concerned about. Those of you who live further up in the watershed uh, are probably worrying because your income isn't that high. You're not going to pay 60 grand a household to put in a sewer. So you know, it's, it does tend to boil down <coughs> about money. Of course, it's lifestyle and many, many other things. But at the end of the day, decisions are made about money. I want to talk a bit about that, and in essence, that's the precursor to why I'm going to put the case that I think we've got the wrong fundamental system design in our minds, generally, and that what I want to plant in your minds is resource recovery. Unless we really think about this as a system of resources, we get rid of the word waste. Waste is a terrible word. We don't have waste water. We have residuals that are somebody else's benefit. Okay, so we need to frame our thinking in that sense. All right. Just a little more background in rough terms. So we're flushing down the loo, you might say in Australia, I don't know if you use that term here. Three to seven percent of electricity production. What an incredible waste. Why, why are we doing this? Well, there's a long history as to why we're doing that. It was an engineering solution of the day that helped. Okay. But in addition to that, when we're looking at a systems view of the world, when we think about where energy is consumed in the home, whilst there's a lot we're throwing down the sewer, after heating and cooling our homes, which use an awful lot of energy in this country particularly, 14% of electricity production or energy production is used for heating water in the homes in this country. So when we're going to solve a systems problem, we need to be thinking about, obviously, the energy, water, and excess. We need to be thinking about food and other things in the whole package here. Okay. So there's our traditional thinking. That's engineering dominated. Water supply to a city. Uh, we have a single <coughs> sewer taking that black and gray water through to some wastewater treatment works that produces two fractions of biosolids that largely goes to landfill. And an effluent still relatively rich in nutrients that goes into estuarine or riverine, estuarine, coastal waterways. Stormwater sort of bypasses things here and, and some of it infiltrates, some of it's combined sewer overflows, of course, that you're very familiar with as well. So I want to go through how do we get there, look at a systems view for how we might reframe the problem and think about getting out of this situation. And another little monetary thing on the bottom line there, I don't know if you can see down the back of the room, it's a bit hard to see, perhaps you can see something stretching next, but what we're saying here is that, you know, from an earlier EPA report back in 2005, 
something like $20 billion a year shortfall in just maintaining the current infrastructure that we have on the ground today. Many billions and billions of dollars of pipes and infrastructure are just rotting in the ground. Most of them come to the end of their useful working life. That you know, varies from 50 to 80 to 100 years, depending on the corrosivity of the soils and so forth. So we're going to need to replace an awful lot of infrastructure in this country, relatively speaking, over the next 20 years. I would advocate, let's not just put in a, a replaced sewer. Okay. So how do we get here? Well, it all comes back to money. And these nice old steam engines, back in the Great Fire of London in 1666, we can go to the US here and uh, basically, the insurance industry drove waterworks. If you had a water supply to five fires, you got a reduction in your premiums. Hence, when the insurance industry came to this country back in the 1780s, or 1870s, I should say, um, that's what drove waterworks. Okay. Unfortunately, if you design, which we do today still, design our waterworks on being able to supply firefighting flow to various parts of a city, and I'm here really thinking of a more city, urban, suburban context. We have a lot of stagnant water sitting in reservoirs where we lose water quality. So there's another downside to it all. The second reason why we started to get interested in water, drinking water supplies, of course, was public health from the point of view of pathogens, from fecal contamination in waters. And this is some recent data from the Centers for Disease Control in a joint publication actually with EPA, just published last year. But it's just identifying the agents that cause waterborne disease outbreaks that we get through currently uh, through drinking water supply systems. So a lot of the time we don't identify the agent. And there's a whole suite of reasons I could explain why. But in essence, when you get a little bit sick, you don't necessarily go to a doctor, and that doctor doesn't necessarily send a sample to a lab, and that lab doesn't necessarily do the right analyses and so forth. But the more interesting one I want to raise here is Legionella. We've had a fecal fetish in the microbiology sphere saying, well, you know, there's a pathogen that's come from fecal contamination of the water. And yes, there have been cholera and typhoid, but we know engineering-wise how to deal with those problems today. Surprisingly, since the data has been collected in 2001, Legionella has been identified as coming through our water supplies at low levels, but it really amplifies in buildings, and this is the problem, and amplifies particularly in, in larger buildings where the water temperature and stagnation is higher, low chlorine residuals. 30% of outbreaks are due to this one organism, Legionella pneumophila, serum group one in this country, and they cause 80% of the waterborne deaths. So we don't have any regulations on this organism as an agency because it's a premise plumbing issue largely, and we don't really push the plumbing codes to, to control this issue yet. So here's a, an interesting point about you know, where is the real target for packaging <coughs> All right, you could say we're wasting energy, and let's look at the conventional configuration, because there's a lot of work going on around this country and internationally on how we can squeeze and get more energy efficient. We, you know, everyone gets excited that our wastewater works will be energy neutral. We're recovering methane to pass our sewage works. Well, isn't that fantastic? Well, it's a good step, but it's not overall the right direction. If we look here at energy kilowatt hours, the first thing we can do is water conservation. And that's the, the simplest thing to do in any large sort of city environment is use water more wisely. We can then start using stormwater and reusing that to substitute as a non-potable water source. But when we start using pumps and things, we're starting then to increase the energy demand again for the unit of water produced. And we can offset that with renewable energy. But at the end of the day, once we start having to treat now full wastewater using ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis sort of technologies, there's a lot more energy involved, a lot more renewable energy is required, and we actually hit a brick wall with the conventional system structure. We, we're competing with other needs for that renewable energy, and we just haven't got the means to do 100% recycle that way and reduce our energies further. We're going to always increase our energy demand on society. So the system configuration is wrong, the current one. When I worked in Sydney Water, we started this major initiative on demand management, as it was referred to, and quickly flick through rather than jumping back and forth. <coughs> the bottom line is, back in 1972 and today, they use the same amount of raw water from the river system in Sydney, and yet the population's increased about 1.3 million people. They've achieved that, as you can see, through a whole range of strategies, including 
including sort of regulatory ones, uh, using recycled water, uh, reducing leakage from 30% down to less than 3%, uh, increasing uh, businesses being more water aware, uh, residential um, outdoor use and indoor use, all of these things have contributed to water conservation. We've done that now, and there's now another million people expected by 2020 in the city of Sydney, or this, in a city of about five million people. They, they can't squeeze any more efficiencies out of demand management because they need to think about the system structure. So ultimately, Sydney is solving their problem, not really, by putting in desalination. But that's pushed that energy footprint up enormously. So it's the, the same old problem we talked about before. When you look at a whole system, you fix one area, the bubble bursts somewhere else. So cities like Sydney and others are not on a sustainable path um, at this stage. If we look at alternatives like rainwater tank and collection uh, in Sydney and in Brisbane, it's just looking for sort of energy use to produce water. Um, it's not bad, but if we look at the city of Melbourne, um, that's the worst, but even their mean energy use for a, for a unit of water that's pumped then back into the house is equivalent to a desalination plant. So we need to be really careful on the design of rainwater tanks in the sense of the pumping, the types of pumps and the, and the head levels of things, because we can end up using as much energy as a desalination plant does. Okay. And the last point here in some ways is phosphate. So it's not about nitrogen. I claim it's obviously just not nitrogen. It's phosphorus, potassium, energy, a whole suite of issues that you heard from Ken earlier. We need to look at this as a whole parcel of issues. Rock phosphate is the basis of modern agriculture. Since the Green Revolution of the 60s, we've relied on this finite reservoir in the ground. And we're going to mine all of that rock phosphate in about something like 70 years if we start going into biofuels, or 120 years thereabouts even if we don't go into biofuels globally. Interestingly, where do these sources come from? <coughs> Morocco has the world's largest <coughs> reserve, okay, over here. In Florida, we've only got about 2.2, but we're going to knock that out in the next 50 to 70 years of readily available, commercially available phosphorus. The rest of the world, 70%. Morocco is going to have a monopoly in a politically somewhat unstable part of the world. We need to be engineering our system for phosphorus recycling, whilst global agriculture is doomed. Okay? So there are some big issues here, not just tape issues here. I'll get across. So if we start looking at the likely trends, you know, we've heard questions about climate change, and we can argue our heads off as to what that might mean, but it's pretty clear already uh, from the intense storms and sewer overflows and power outages that we get, we need to build systems that are more resilient. Current sewers are designed to leak. And when it rains, they infiltrate if they're not already a combined sewer overflow system. So systems that like even pressure sewers or vacuum sewers are designed not to leak are a huge step forward. Off-the-grid systems are much more resilient. As we have an aging population in, in parts of the country, particularly maybe this part of the country, uh, diseases that cause respiratory disease, like that Legionella I was talking about, are becoming much more important. So that's an aerosol problem. So when we start thinking about water fixtures, garden irrigation, shower heads, and things like that, we need to be thinking about this disease problem. Greenhouse gases, another area, and recovery of energy. <coughs> So the old paradigm where we sort of have a once, flip, once through system goes out into the riverine system, it pollutes the waterways. We have known about this for you know, a few hundred years in essence. We need to be closing the loop. So not only do we have a nice looking, pristine, livable environment, but we're closing the loops on water within the urban environment, <coughs> in urban areas, we're closing our food loops. Now all that nitrogen phosphorus that goes in the sewer has come from food we've eaten. It needs to get back out there to close that loop. Okay. So the solutions that I worked on with the Swedish government for a number of years was really around how do we grapple with this concept of sustainability? How do we look at what might be a more or a range of more sustainable solutions? 